Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week our guest is United States Senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. Now remember, we love taking your questions, so write in to politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the links to our sponsors, Total Gym, Beam, and Miracle Made in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. James Carville, I have written literally thousands of columns, and there's a number that I'd love to have back. One that I don't want back, and I'd love to highlight, however, is last Friday's Substack column arguing the Democrats' MVP for 2024 is Sam Alito, the conservative Supreme Court justice who orchestrated the 2022 decision overturning Roe v. Wade, uh, abortion protections, an issue Democrats have been capitalizing capitalizing on ever since. It has become an even bigger deal this week. Donald Trump, whose only position on abortion is what it, how it helps him, said now he believes, let's just leave it to the states and not give Democrats a national issue. A couple of days later, Arizona answered as the state Supreme Court, with the end of Roe, validated an 1864 act that bans all abortion except for the health of the mother. This has Republicans apoplectic and Democrats salivating over the prospects of an abortion rights referendum on the Arizona ballot this November. Sam Alito's gift just keeps giving. Now, some questions for Trump, uh, which, of course, he'll evade or lie. How's he going to vote in the Florida referendum this fall? The option is between codifying state laws to give basic Roe-type protections or allow a ban after six weeks when some women don't even know they're pregnant. How, you know, if a state issue, if it's a state issue, then do we can we assume he'll oppose any changes in federal law that restrict abortion? What's he going to do? What's he going to say or do about any restrictions on the mailing or distribution of mufepristone, the abortion pill? You know, this issue promises to bring out resistant Democratic voters, independent women, young voters, people of color. Uh, and 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 not just in states where it's on the ballot. It's a tough year for Democrats, but I'll tell you this, James, it, it was we learned anew this week, the issue of choice may change the odds. Well, and I, I don't know this, but there's been, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of words written about how the Democrats have a problem with Gaza, that a lot of their base voters don't, don't like this. And to tell you the truth, it is a problem. When am I going to read something or see something that says Trump's got a real problem with his pro-life right flank? Now, you know, he has to say how he doesn't have to, but he'll, he'll flip-flop around, but he's going to be caught with it on the Florida thing. Right. By the way, so will Rick Scott. Big, big, big deal here. And if you already see Lindsey Graham and some of the pro-life people the whole existence has been abortion is murder. And now they say, well, it's not so much murder. It's now 15, 16 weeks. And I understand that they, they, they're trying to move themselves away from what they started, but they're going to start losing enthusiasm on their right, Frank. And I frankly think we haven't asked that enough or talked about enough that you're moving to Rome. Trump is now... For Roe v. Wade, that was a twelve. That was first trimester, and had you know different standards, different rules. So you just throw the whole towel in. Uh, first of all, no one in the middle or the semi left is going to believe them anyway, and they're going to lose something. We got to make them pay. They're going to lose something on their right. Because after all of these years, you know how many the abortion platform and the Republican Party and uh, four-year platform, uh, how much speeches they've given, and now oh well, well no 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 you don't understand. I I I I think this is a good issue for all across America. I think it's a terrific issue. I think Dobbs is clearly maybe more than any issue in my life changed the political equation in this country, but. They got to pay on the right. And, you know, even though Lindsey Graham, squiggly, squiggly biscuit, y'all call him, 
he's he's trying. He got happy about it. And the uh, National Right to Life people, they're not happy about it. Mike Pence is not happy about it. But all I'm going to read about is Dearborn, which is a problem. I, I'm not saying it's not a problem, but when are we going to start talking about how this is a real problem on their right? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, they usually tend to go along. I, I certainly think it's going to energize some Democratic voters who wouldn't vote otherwise, and maybe some people in the middle, and maybe some there. You, you know, the, the Republicans are such hypocrites. Lindsey Graham has a 15-week ban, right? Sounds okay, fine. 15 weeks, reasonable. But when you read his proposal, what it says is it's a 15-week ban. That's, that's a ceiling. So therefore, if you're in New York or California, you know, you can't have a 16-week or 18-week ban. But if you're Alabama or Mississippi, you, you can have no ban or you can have a total ban. Uh, so they're, they're, they're playing games with the issue as they, as they have all along. Uh, I think it's going to come back to bite them. And, I, you know, I just make one more point, James. This is, this is thanks to Heather Cox Richardson. That Arizona 1864 law, her Substack column today was terrific on this. It not only, you know, prohibited any uh, abortion or any dissemination uh, uh, of uh, information on abortion, it's, it barred blacks or Native Americans or Asians from ever testifying against whites. It was enacted during the Civil War. Women couldn't vote, uh, and by a legislature of 27 men. Okay, Carrie Lake, let's see you defend that one, baby. So, all right, uh, the, let's talk about last week's podcast with Justice Breyer, talking about textualism and originalism, that the plain meaning of the statute. Now, wait a minute, uh, 1864 statute passed by the territorial legislature, of which at the time slavery was legal. Women, I don't think women could own property, much less vote. But this is where textualism gets you. The Alabama, I mean, the Arizona Supreme Court would say, well, gee, this is a statute. And just like we're getting ready to talk about the Comstock Act today, if you believe in originalism, if you believe in, in you know, the language and the textualism, I don't know, whatever stupid jackass thing they have, this is where you end up. And, and all we've been told Oh, there you go again. And I could do this. Then I could do that. Well, just look at what the Alabama Supreme Court's done. Look what the Arizona Supreme Court's done. And by the way, I'm not worried about 15 weeks of Trump saying this. If you remember Glenn Youngkin, you know, who's the slippiest snake you've ever seen, the people don't believe they don't. them. They, and they didn't believe them when they told them they were going to do this. They better start believing them now. And we, you know, we got to start talking about this. And we got Senator Smith coming up on the show, and she's got an absolutely massively critical piece of legislation coming. And we got to, you know, we got to get this yeah, thing we out of the to, Senate and, and get it uh, to the House. There ought to be a vote in the Senate. I mean, we'll talk to Senator Smith about this. But, uh, you know, Donald Trump 20 years ago proudly proclaimed he was pro choice. And then, and then 10 years later, when he thought about running for the Republican nomination, he proudly proclaimed he was pro-life. And he even went so far as to say, maybe, maybe it ought to be criminalized and women ought to be prosecuted. He doesn't believe a thing on this. This is just a matter of convenience, but he's going to get caught up. He's not going to be able to get by, I think, for the next seven months uh, lying and playing cute because it's an issue. We've seen it, James. You've known, you first went to Kansas and said, this thing is going to take off. And it did. And right. it did in Ohio. And it did in Virginia. And it did in the 4th District uh, of New York in the special election. And it did in Alabama. And it will in November. So I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here. You could go back and everything that Donald Trump said on this is hypocritical. We all know that. He's been everywhere. Don't pay attention to what Donald Trump says. Pay attention to what he did. He turned the federal judiciary over to Leonard Leo. You got the predictable. He gave, he said, he gave him the three votes they needed to overturn, right? The Fifth Circuit is out of its goddamn mind, all right? It's out of their mind. And, and this Judge Kaczmarek out in Amarillo, and this is the logically result of what Donald Trump did. We, we can own anything. Well, of course, he's a fucking hypocrite. Of course, he 
will say anything, but he has already talked about he's going to give them. He is going to turn the entire Justice Department. In, uh, by the way, they can enforce any, this, this, this horrible Comstock Act anytime they want to. The law is still on the books. So I, I would say don't worry about what Donald Trump says. Look at what he did. Oh, I, I don't disagree. I, I, you know, I think that's absolutely right. And what he does is he does whatever is, is, is politically convenient, advantageous. He plays, if he wants to give something to the base, he'll give it to him. Couldn't doesn't care. Uh, and it, it, it will cause a lot of damage. Anyway, keep on this issue. It's going to be a big one for the next seven months. James, I, I want to bring up one other uh, issue about, about the Republican Party. The pro-Putin wing of the party got a boost from its leader, Donald J. Trump, who floated a so-called peace plan for the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, his peace plan would allow his friends, the Russians, to keep Crimea, which had illegally annexed years ago, and give big chunks of eastern Ukraine to the Moscow dictator. In short, it would largely reward Russia's illegal invasion and sell out our courageous ally. Now, the Putin wing is growing. I mean, don't think it's just a small faction. Senators like J.D. Vance, House members like Marjorie Taylor Greene, outside provocateurs like faux journalist Tucker Carlson, and, of course, the returning Trump advisor, convicted criminal Paul Manafort, Putin's very useful idiot. Look, at some point, there have to be negotiations to end this miserable war. Um, maybe, for example, there needs to be an internationally supervised referendum in, crime, in Crimea. But if Trump and the American Putins have their way, does anyone think the Russians would stop with that kind of a deal? They wouldn't. It would be another problem two years later, five years, ten years later, and it would probably mark the end of NATO. Well, uh, the, the, the thing is, there's getting to be considerable pushback from Republicans. Uh, it's got Mike, yep. Mike Turner, Mike, the Chairman of the yep. Intelligence Committee, and other guys. Are, is it McFaul Mc, from Texas, Michael McFaul? Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure you, Liz Cheney, is going to be very vocal. There's a reason for this. It's not philosophical, all right? It's not anything. I guarantee you it's Russian money all over, all over Republican politics. I'm, ta yeah, I'm talking to you, J.D. Vance. I'm talking to all of you. I believe to, to every core of my fiber that money, money, and more money is behind this. I think Russian money was behind Trump. I think Russian money is flooding Republican politics in the United States. I wish if, the, you know, maybe the FBI is too scared of the politics of it, but I wish these crack Democratic researchers and these crack Washington progressive advocacy groups or whatever it is, uh, the journalists, uh, I wish they put untold resources and effort into tracking Russian money coming into Republican politicians in the United States. I, I fundamentally believe that is at the core of all of this. Money. Money and more money. Yeah, I think it was last time, and I think it is this time, too. Um, uh, 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 Trump claims, I, I, you know, it just drives you crazy. Trump claims he could negotiate an end to this war in 24 hours because he is this great negotiator. It's just like, James, didn't he negotiate a nuclear treaty with North Korea where they gave up their nuclear weapons? Did I? He said he was going to, so I guess he did, didn't he? I, I think he can end the war in 24 hours. And I don't think it's going to be a negotiation. I think he's going to give the Russians whatever they want. Just give the Russians whatever they want. Actually, it, 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 I think if he's president that Russian adventurism will, will tap down because they'll control the United States government. What is? What do we need this for? So I, I give him credit. Yeah. He, he, he just, you know, shaft the Ukrainians, shaft the Poles, shaft the Slovakians, shaft the Romanians, shaft the entire Eastern Europe, and, and uh, Russia's happy to make peace with him. Well, James, I have an idea. I mean, he's such a terrible negotiator because he just gives everything away, right? I mean, that's what uh, you're that's saying. That's not a negotiation. So, no, of course <laughs> it's not. So I, ha I have an idea. Let's get Politicon to enlist Trump to negotiate a new politics war room deal for you and me. Imagine all those vacation homes uh, we could have. <laughs> We, we could, if we agree to Russian propaganda, I could, we could figure out a way to get a check.
Transform your life with Total Gym. I, I tell you what, I'm sitting right here on the Mississippi coast, and it, there's actually a, a mini hurricane going on right in front of me. And I'm a person that has to work out every day. Well, if I got a home gym, I don't, I, I don't need to go outside. I don't need to go into lightning. I don't need to if you live up north. I don't need to go into ice. So anybody, and, and you can't deny the staggering benefits of exercise to somebody's health. And when you got it right in your house, you don't have an excuse. And this stuff works. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Not only, you know, can you be, um, you know, in because of a hurricane, but anytime it's tough to find time to go to a gym. Uh, We know how much easier it is if you benefit from a home workout. Finding a system, on the other hand, wasn't easy. Finally, we discovered a convenient home workout. You, You love it. It's a total gym. If you want a total body workout in just 10 to 20 minutes, you need a Total Gym. Right now, you can try Total Gym for 30 days for just $1 plus free shipping. Seriously, $1. The Total Gym Fit. Total Gym's newest model lets you do over 85 exercises in one home gym. Never get bored working out again. Total Gym accommodates all fitness levels from ages 6 to 80. Literally, anyone listening to this is going to enjoy Total Gym. Total Gym works out multiple muscle groups simultaneously. So 60 plus minutes becomes only 10 to 20. I got in a great full body session this morning after breakfast. You work up a sweat in only 15 minutes. So I had plenty of time to prepare for you, James Carville. I hit my legs, core, chest, and everything in between. I'm so much more confident in my movement and strength, you know, about my brain, but at least my body parts. And we know Total Gym will improve your life too. Total Gym works by using a percent of your body weight as resistance. Setting the resistance level higher builds muscle, setting it lower, tones, and slenders. The unique design allows you to easily move from one exercise to another without having to add or remove weights. That means you can do strength training, cardio, and stretching all in one machine. There's no assembly required, and it sets up in a matter of minutes. Plus, it folds conveniently for storage. Now, how great do you feel after workout, James? Well, I think people should do a little back of the envelope calculation. You don't need very much math skills. Call your local or your long term health club, and see what it costs you a month, and take that cost. And think of how much money goes right into your pocket. And and think of all the time that you spend going to the health club, being there, coming back from the health club, thinking of everything else. You got total gym at home. You're saving money and you're making things more convenient. I don't know what there's not to like about this. You're you're absolutely right. You know, you you know, forget the fads, the fitness fads. Get results. Remember, it only takes to ten to twenty minutes a day to reshape your body. Head to total gym direct.com slash war room for an additional 20% off your order. Plus that includes a free ab crunch attachment, by the way, and free shipping. Please note that war room is in all lowercase. This special offer won't be available for that much longer. That's total gym direct.com slash war room for an additional 20% off and make sure you go to our URL totalgymdirect.com slash warroom, all lowercase, so they know we sent you. You can find the link in our show notes, too. James, our guest is the United States Senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. She comes from a long line of great public servants from that state, none more so than her mentor, Fritz Mondale. Before she was lieutenant governor and then tapped for the U.S. Senate, she was a Democrat's top political strategist, the James Carville of Minnesota. She was called the (laughs) Velvet Hammer, reflecting a charm and a toughness. Senator Smith, thank you for being with us. Uh, The last time I've been around for a while, the last time I heard about the Comstock Act before you and James seized on it was when the phony purists, I think back in the 70s, were said to be engaged in Comstockery. I, I, it was, I guess, crafted by a perverted postal inspector 150 years ago, banned sending any machine, obscene materials or anything to do with abortion through the mail. I just assumed it had been repealed. 
but it hasn't, and you are moving to do so. Why is this important? Well, you know, we shouldn't even be talking about the Comstock Act. It is this old law that is was constrained, cons, you know, basically landed on the dust, dustbin of history, um, passed in 1873. We shouldn't even be talking about it. It's so ridiculous. But what's happened is that the far right wing has landed on the Comstock Act as a tool that they think that they can use to control what uh, women do with their bodies in 2024 and beyond. And so we have to pay attention to it. And it has never been repealed, though a lot of people think that it is, you know, in large part unconstitutional. It still sits there on the books. And in that way, these, um, I mean, even Alito and Thomas, as uh, James has pointed out, um, referred to it in the uh, oral arguments uh, just a couple weeks ago on uh, the Texas abortion case. So you think they could use this 1873 law to limit uh, the distribution of materials about abortion or abortion pills and just, uh, uh, I mean, really have a huge, huge impact. Well, yeah, and it's not only me that thinks about it. If you read this giant missive, over 800-page missive called Product 2025 that these conservative uh, minds have put together to be a roadmap, for a second Trump presidency, you read in there how they say that the Comstock Act is the tool that they can use to ban the mailing of abortion uh, medication, to ban all sorts of other things related to abortion care um, without ever having to pass a law um, in Congress. They said, basically, you can use this uh, next President Trump as your executive authority to take this step. So as ridiculous as it is, I think that this is why we have to pay attention to it. Well, you make a compelling case, but with Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House and given the GOP's Comstockian caucus, I, I just made up that word, uh, <laughs> nothing <laughs> nothing is going to happen in the House this year. So, so, you know, what do you do? Is there a present danger? Yeah, well, I think it's just important right now that people understand what this could mean, that they, you know, my view about these people is that you have to, like, when they tell you what they are going to do, believe them, uh, that they are serious about it. And so we need to be paying attention to this. I mean, you're making a really good point. We're not going to pass a repeal of the Comstock Act through the U.S. House of Representatives. As you say, they are kind of the Comstockian uh, caucus. Um, and, you know, I don't know that we've got 60 votes in the United States Senate to pass it either. Uh, but we need to be ready, depending on what happens. And that is uh, why I'm raising it now and uh, saying, let's let's get a plan for what we need to do if they try to use this tool to take away women's rights. James. Oh, since I'm so happy to have you. And if anybody doubts in policy legislation, I have one word for them. Arizona. That's right. Okay. Bleed these people. Mm -hmm. Believe every word that they tell you because they said they would overturn Roe, they overturned Roe. All right, they wanted to enforce the Comstock Act, they could enforce the Comstock Act. They wanted to enforce some 1864 Territorial Legislature Act, and that's originalism that protected them. But I'm excited to have you for a lot of reasons. I, I have many friends in, in Minneapolis uh, Judge Jack and Kathy Toonheim, yeah. Charlie Newen, uh, Mike. Hurley, uh, Senator Klobuchar. I met uh, your Attorney General Keith Ellison on the beam of a synagogue <laughs> <laughs> in Minneapolis. So uh, I, that's what I've always loved about Minnesota. There's real tolerance and, and real uh, pluralism that goes on in your state. And I, my hat goes off to it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm like pretty honored that Al uh, said that I was like the, before I came to the Senate, that I was like the James Carville of Minnesota, because I, <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know if anyone has ever called you the Velvet Hammer. I don't know about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, but I'll tell you, we, we need a lot of hammers and we need a lot of saws and we need a lot of nails because I, I want to show you a chart that I, this is just in my, there is a war on women. We can agree with mm -hmm. that, right? I mean, it is pretty clear. It's definitely in every war has a chain of command. All right. And I just did this with terrible graphics, <laughs> but at the top of the, the top, the chief of staff is Leonard Leo. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to the, the, Mike Johnson, Aaron Howley, who would, by the way, were the plaintiffs in the Arizona mm -hmm. case, the Speaker of the House and the wife of one of the most prominent United States senators were, who brought the Arizona case, 
Then you have Trump because he's just a tool. And then underneath this, you have the Alabama Supreme Court, the Arizona Supreme Court, the Florida State Legislature, whoever you want. Mm -hmm. But you can have and you can do it pretty good. And just, we can have a chain of command for the war on women because there is a war on women. And Leonard Leo is the supreme commander of all anti-women forces in the United States. That is so true. You know, he, Leonard Leo sits atop this uh, giant dark money machine that has been all about shaping the courts and the politics of this country. And if you have any doubt about that, then just look at the current makeup of the United States Supreme Court, because it is his um, dream uh, put into place. And as you say, what is the result of that? The result of that is overturning Roe. Uh, the first time in you know, my word, I have been working on women's health issues and reproductive rights issues since I was, uh, you know, I was a young woman myself when I back when I worked at Planned Parenthood and even before then. And he has been he has been dedicated to uh, overturning those rights. So that today, as we all know, like my granddaughter, who is only three months old, has fewer rights uh, today than I did when I was a young woman. And if this is not an accident. This was a plan, as you were showing your chart. And um, right. that's the thing that we have to understand. And that's why we need a plan uh, to fight back for the good of and for the, you know, for the health and, and freedom of people all over the country. Well, I, I, for, for the war on the war on women, I, my suggestion is that we have General Tina Smith, D. Minnesota, <laughs> as the supreme <laughs> allied commander. But I, I go a little bit deeper. If we want to know where the future of the war on women is, go to the Fifth Circuit. Mm -hmm. That is an entirely Leonard Leo side. I mean, it, it, a huge majority of Leonard Leo acolytes in, in, in the Fifth Circuit, and that is the... Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, which historically mm -hmm. has been one of the most, believe it or not, enlightened circuit courts of appeals in the United States. It is now, and I would recommend have, have people pull up Professor Stephen Valdick at the University of Texas Austin Law School, who's written very eloquently and very truthfully about this. But as, as we go forward, so your, your bill is coming up to repeal the Comstock Act, which is a which is a statute of the United States right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And there's no reason. There's no reason that it can't be enforced. That's exactly right. Exactly. I mean, and, and you know, of course, as you know, if if these you know right wingers go after uh, uh, enforcing the Comstock Act, you were talking about in Minnesota. You know, my attorney general, the great Keith Ellison, will fight that in court in every way that he can. But you and I know that federal law preempts state law on all these issues. And so even though in Minnesota, our legislature and great governor and lieutenant governor have put into law the basic freedom, uh, you know, access to abortion, um, federal law could completely overturn that. And that is why this is a risk, not only to the one in uh, three women that live in states where abortion is um, now basically banned, but in cl also in states like Minnesota, where the people of Minnesota have said, um, you know, we want to have those freedoms and that could be changed by a, a future Trump presidency. So like, just like you said, believe them when they tell you what they are going to do because they are serious about it. They have a plan. And that's why this election is so important, why we have to fight back. Right. And, and you're commanding an, an army that is against an army that Lent Leo has $1.6 billion. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of a ragtag group. Of, we're, we're underdogs, we're under fire, we're under assault, but uh, we're coming there. And I can tell you, this is one Cajun is waiting on orders from our Supreme Commander, Senator Smith of Minnesota. So, <laughs> <laughs> take the lead here. We're ready. We're, we're, so, we're ready to follow you, Albert. Well, that, that's uh, good. You know, yeah, we, well, you know, we, we might be under resourced compared to Leonard Leo, but we have uh, we have the facts and the um, and the the. the the good cause. We might be, we're, a, I don't know, we're, I guess we're not a band of brothers uh, completely. We're a band of <laughs> sisters and brothers uh, fighting, right. fighting this, uh, fighting this battle. And, but, you know, I think I can tell you where, you know, when I go out talking to people about this, they, they, people understand this and they're not, you know, just this last week, Donald Trump put out this video saying, oh, I think this should be a state's rights issue. And I don't believe that people are going to buy that. They understand 
what's going on here. And they are not going to they're not going to be conned uh, by Donald Trump um, on the issue of abortion. He can't even say the same thing. You know, he, he can't even be consistent in a four minute video about what it is that he that he thinks here. So I think we know exactly where he stands. Absolutely. What he's done. Yeah. So since Smith, one place that this Arizona thing yeah. is going to, I think, be enormously helpful is to my friend, Congressman Ruben Gallego. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is a, you know, we have so many critical Senate races coming up. And Arizona, of course, being one of the really critical ones, I expect that this will be a big boost to to uh, Senator Gallego. I mean, Congressman Gallego's chances. I think that Senator Rosen, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure she's jumping all over this. But you know, you got to be sure that the place that it, when the caucus is meeting, the place that I think we have a chance for pickup, I, I honestly do, is Florida. Mm-hmm. It, we, have a, we have a really good candidate. We didn't have a bruising primary. Rick Scott is all, is right on this whole cut everybody so security Medicare, raise taxes on hotel maids, mm-hmm. give when Trump told those billionaires in Palm Beach, I'm going to I'm going to keep your tax cuts. And to the extent that you have you do have a lot of influence. What I think the president, we, I think we Democrats should come up with, we're not expending the tax cuts. And that money is going to be going in a pool to lower interest rates for first-time home mm-hmm. buyers. Mm-hmm. Because we're getting killed with under 30 that believe and understandably that they're not going to have a chance to buy a house. Right. I'm over 65. Now, you couldn't miss making money in this market. I get all so I, I get Social Security, I get Medicare, I get Medicare Part D, and the young people, are, are, and we do much better with old people because, but but we have to show mm-hmm. some signature item that we understand that, and I, I I think the linkage of the Trump tax cuts for over half a million dollars a year, and mortgage relief or some GI bill, you know, I, I got the GI bill. Mm-hmm. I got the yeah. GI Bill. I went to college. On the, I went to law school on the GI Bill. I went. I bought my first house on the GI Bill. Why? Why? These young people don't have that. So this is something to bring up yeah. to, to the caucus. Ed. I, I totally I listen to you because I totally agree with you, James. And you know, first of all, just on Florida, I I agree with you on how Florida is a place where we have a real opportunity to pick up. Uh, a Senate seat. And everybody kind of rolls their eyes and says, oh, my word, I can't believe you're optimistic about Florida after everything that we've been through. But I mean, you, if you look at the numbers and the data, first of all, Debbie McCarcel Powell, who's running against Rick Scott, is a strong candidate. She is she's she's won in a um, predominantly Cuban district in South Florida. She's a Latina woman. She is um, very uh, she's just so capable. And nobody likes Rick Scott, including in Florida. Right. And in fact, you know, we were talking Wonder about- Wonder why. Yeah, I know what. <laughs> we were talking about the issue of abortion rights. And Rick Scott has said, um, you know, I always say the Republicans don't have a message problem on abortion. They have a policy problem. And But Rick Scott didn't even apparently get the message memo because he just said that not only does he would, would he have signed the six week abortion ban in Florida, um, but that he's going to vote against uh, the abortion rights ballot initiative. So he's completely out of step uh, with women in Florida. And, you know, remember our colleague uh, Bill Nelson, who was the last Democratic senator from Florida, only lost by a, a, a fraction uh, because it was yeah, right, so like close. 8, so votes. it's, it's so, um, another thing before I turn it over is our chair part of Nick. Our chair in Florida, uh, Nikki Freed, is quite good. Mm-hmm. And she cleared the primary field. We don't have these stupid primaries anymore. But I, 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 and I, I know Senator Schumer uh, is, you know, he hates to go into a state with 13 media markets, but I think <laughs> this is a real opportunity and yeah, preach I agree. the gospel of Florida. Yeah. Albert, Senator Smith, let me, let me take you 
back just to one more question on the Comstock Act. I hope you and Leader Schumer, you, you said you weren't sure there were the 60 votes in the Senate. I hope you'll bring it up. Even if you don't have the 60 votes, I'd like to see some of those Republicans squirm mm-hmm. uh, 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 supporting the Comstock Act. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's an issue that people will understand. Yep. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that it is an issue that people understand. And uh, and, I, and I think there's sort of this like, what? Wait a minute. You're telling me that the health care that I'm able to get today is going to be influenced and even controlled by this <laughs> this law that was passed, you know, in 1873. It, it just does not make any sense to people. And um, yeah, doesn't make any sense. And it's it's to... Uh, it's why I think it's important that we pay attention to it. You know, it's the tool that shouldn't be used, but if they're going to use it, then we've got to fight back. Let me try just a couple others. The Ukrainians are mm-hmm. just getting by barely. They really need mm-hmm. support. They need weapons. They need uh, assistance. Is Congress going to pass an aid package uh, in the next month or two? I mean, it is unconscionable what the Speaker is doing in the U.S. House of Representatives re- refusing to bring up this bill that passed the Senate with such broad broad bipartisan support. And I'll tell you, when you then you hear some of these Republicans really literally mouthing the talking points of Putin and the Russian government right. on on this issue, it is it is sh- shocking. So, I mean, you know, I I get where the situ- where the speaker is right now and the threat that he has from Marjorie Taylor Greene and others to depose him if he does the right thing. But, um, I mean, this is, Ukraine will be, will, will, Ukraine will lose if the United States of America doesn't stand with our allies in Europe. And that is going to hurt all of our national security. And that is why it's uh, just you know, so I don't know. Is is the is the speaker going to finally bring it up? I mean, a lot of us think that ultimately he will, uh, but you know, it sometimes don't you it feels like it's a bit of a bait and switch. I mean, he always says he will, and then he never does, and time goes by, and we don't have unlimited amounts of time as we look at this. Situation. He's scared. He's scared stiff. You know. You know. One one more foreign policy question. You've been very critical of the way Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has been waging the war with ghastly civilian casualties. The killing of the World Central Kitchen convoy Mm -hmm. last week was only the latest. And I think you've said correctly that what he's doing is against the national security interest of the United States. So I guess my question to you and also to the Biden administration, why not break with this government? Say we have no more important ally than Israel, but if the current prime minister won't work with us, we can't work with him. We are ready to immediately restore aid and votes in international forums only when that government is willing to work with us. Yeah. You have to do something dramatic. I mean, I think that this is a classic situation where actions are going to speak louder than words when it comes to Netanyahu and his far right coalition in Israel. And clearly he is not listening to President Biden as Biden, as, as our president has done everything that he can to get the uh, Netanyahu government to wage this war following U.S. standards and international law. And that's why I think the president has got to figure out um, how to change our actions in order to truly get the attention of, of Netanyahu. And as I've said, um, the you know, this is this is damaging the United States national security interests as well as the national security interests of Israel, the way in which this war has been prosecuted. And it is such a terrible, terrible tragedy. Of course, Israel has the right and even the moral obligation to defend itself when it is attacked in this heinous way by Hamas terrorists. Uh, but they also have a responsibility and an obligation to not do the kind of massive civilian uh, damage and halting humanitarian aid that is, uh, that, that's been happening. So, yeah. I think you need to do something dramatic with Netanyahu because he doesn't care what we think. He cares about his own interest mm-hmm. in staying out of jail. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, you know a lot more about this than I do, but I don't think, uh, you know, trying to pressure him with phone calls and the like is going to matter to him. Mm-hmm. 
I think, I mean, I think we've seen the result of that strategy over the last several, um, over the last many months. And uh, I think that, um, you know, I agree. And that's why I've been, I mean, I've been so proud, honestly, to join with uh, my colleague, Chris Van Hollen and other members of the United States Senate to, uh, Democratic members of the United States Senate to um, um, urge the administration to uh, use the power that we have to put conditions on the aid that we provide to Israel so that it is not used to inflict these massive civilian casualties. James, do you have some final uh, a final I'll question for the Velvet up, Hammer? Uh, yeah, quick uh, for the Velvet Hammer. Quick observation. <clears throat> you, you've listened to these Republicans. Well, if you live in one state, you have this. You live in another state, you have that. Okay, I live in Louisiana. But very, very red. And like you, I, I became a grandfather a little bit longer. My, my grandchild was a little over 15 months old. But when my daughter told me that she was pregnant, you know the first phone call I made? I, I found a lawyer. I called the head of the, Dr. Catherine O'Neill. I called the head of the largest hospital system in Louisiana. I said, I need the best health care lawyer in the state. And she gave me the name of a health care lawyer. And I called a woman who ever happened to be a woman. And I said, I, you know, I, don't, I know these things are just not a chip shot. Some of them don't go the way they're supposed to go. And I need a lawyer. But, but most people don't, don't know the head of the largest hospitals in their state. Most people just can't That's right. call a, a partner at a big law firm and have them, on, you know, get their cell phone number in case we got to get legal advice. And I think a lot of times, you know, in Minnesota, you're probably for now okay. In North Dakota, mm, not so good. Mm -hmm. Iowa, not so good. And there are actually people that live in these states. About Kansas, we have a lot of good friends. Governor Laura Kelly, I think, one of the mm -hmm. more admirable people in American politics. So as this debate goes on, you know, as a blue state senator, keep in the back of your mind that there are people in red states that have to live under the, these draconian degrees, decrees, and not all of them can afford Top tier counsel. I'll just leave it at that. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. And I think that uh, John Tester and um, some of my colleagues that, that are representing some, you know, John Tester, Sherry Brown, representing some pretty red states know that that's the fact as well. Right. And uh, that's why the, that's why this issue matters so much to people. Absolutely. I'm going out to Monday. Well, I just want to ask the Velvet Hammer if she'll agree to come back uh, sometime because you've been a great guest, Senator Smith. Tremendous. I'd love to and come back anytime. It's fun to talk with you both. It's a it's it's a deal, and uh, good luck. Uh, and I hope you bring that Comstock Act repeal up on the Senate floor and make those Republicans vote. Our <laughs> yeah, Supreme Commander, Senator Smith. Thank you so much. It's such right. an honor to you. Great to talk Senator, with you. Both. So many friends in Minnesota. Thank you. Drift off to dreamland with a delicious cup of bean. Tell you what, I, I, I do it, and I think, it, the, the, you know, I believe in attacking sleep from, from several fronts, but this is an important front. This is a real aid. And, you know, we've said it before, and I'll say it again, that the kind of sleep you got the night before is the most determinative thing on how you feel the next day. This is critical. Yeah, sure is. Because sleep's the foundation of our mental and physical health. When you're sleeping well, you can perform at your best, mentally and physically. Proper sleep can also increase focus, boost energy, and improve your mood. Introducing Beam's Dream Powder, a science-backed healthy hot cocoa for sleep. Dream has been a game changer for sleep and because politics can be stressful and covering politics can be stressful. It was horrible watching hours tick by until the alarm would go off. Now you know that all it takes is one delicious cup of beam before getting in bed and sleeping like a baby and ready for the day ahead. And today our listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder. Their science-backed healthy hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. There are tons of delicious flavors like chocolate peanut butter, cinnamon cocoa, and sea salt caramel. They're only 15 calories with zero grams of sugar. Now, you know, you, you, you like to have a different one every night. I love chocolate peanut butter. It's always a treat. And now wanting better sleep no longer is going to keep you up at night. Now, other sleep aids can cause next day grogginess. 
But Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi extract, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, and nano-CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Dream works fast, and the numbers don't lie. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get better sleep. Now, how great is that, James? It, it's, it's, well, first of all, it's a great idea. It actually tastes good, and it works. You know, we, we're so, you know, we're so grow up accustomed to medicine tastes bad. Uh, you know, I, it doesn't work on the, unless it burns the wound. This stuff is good tasting, and it works really well, and it's a significant, makes a significant contribution yeah, to a good yeah, night. right on. Beam Dream, it's easy to add to your nighttime routine. Just mix Dream in the hot water or milk, froth, and enjoy before bed. You'll find out why Forbes and the New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. Now, if you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, Get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash warroom and use code warroom at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash warroom and use the code warroom for up to 40% off. You also can find the link in our show notes. Now for the outrage of the week. President Biden has nominated a highly qualified Muslim, Adele Manji, for a federal appeals court. Now, I expect bigots like Ted Cruz of Texas to find phony reasons to oppose a Muslim judge. But why are three Democrats, including retiring Senator Joe Manchin, buying into the false crap that he's soft on crime or anti-Israel? He's been supported by some police organizations and major Jewish organizations. There's only one reason this judge may not make it, Islamophobia, bigotry. Those who rightly condemn attacks on Jewish Americans should now rally behind this nomination, showing that attacks on Muslims because of their religion is equally unacceptable. I've read about this. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I, I just detest the, anything that deals with someone other than the fact that they're a citizen of the United States. I don't give a shit where you're from, the religion you are, ethnicity, sexual orientation. If you're a citizen and you love your country, which this guy obviously does, then you're entitled to exactly the same thing that anybody else is entitled to. And uh, I, I, I agree with this outrage. For mine, I, I, I half agree with yours, and it's just, it's so outrageous, and I'm, I'm a believer in repetition, but the idea that a state Supreme Court would enforce language in a statute written by territorial legislature in 1864, now get that straight, when, when, when slavery was still legal, women couldn't vote, I don't think they could own property, that goes to sh- show you the threat that this country is up against. And, you know, you keep hearing this, the threat from within and, and that kind of stuff, and you kind of knew it, but you, what this has done is just demonstrated how extreme these people are. That it, it, and this is a state Supreme Court. I, I, don't, I don't get it, man, but it, they, they've given us, they've let us know who they are, they've exposed themselves, and we got to fight like hell. I couldn't agree more. Take your bedroom game to the next level with Miracle Made Sheets. You think all the time you think when you try to get on a cool part of the sheet or a cool part of the pillow, and this stuff is right there for you. It, it's unbelievable. I don't know why somebody didn't think of this before. Yeah, I agree. You know, because sleeping at the right temperature is one of the most important ways to feel rest of the next day. Now, we used to struggle with sleeping too hot, but you can find a way to sleep in perfect comfort all night long using NASA-inspired silver-infused bed sheets by Miracle Made. They're self-cleaning, antibacterial, eco-friendly. Bedding prevents 99.7% of bacteria and requires three times 
less laundry because they stay fresher three times longer. You'll stop sleeping on bacteria that can clog your pores and cause breakouts and acne. So sleep clean with Miracle. And trust us, with no more gross odors, life is a whole lot easier on your spouse. That's because they use temperature-regulating silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA for maximum comfort. They make pillowcases and comforters, too, by the way. Imagine getting better sleep every night. Even better, Miracle Sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They feel as nice or even nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. You'll feel like you're on vacation every time you get into bed. Where are you going to imagine you're sleeping when you're under comfortable and fresh Miracle Sheets? Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code WARROOM at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash warroom to treat yourself. Hey, thanks, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. You also can find the link in our show notes. Okay, and now our questioners from our terrific listeners. I mean, the hardest job every week is to pick out which ones to use because they almost everyone is so good. So we'll go with some now. If we don't get to yours, uh, please uh, write in again because we'll try next week. Uh, the first, this, this is different, uh, James. Ed in Raleigh, North Carolina says, he says, we're living through the rights counter countercultural heyday. Their 1960s, sex is monogamous, music sucks, drugs are terrible. Where does it go from here? You know, it's a good time, but I think we can say from 60 forward, you know, we passed the Civil Rights Act, we passed the Voting Rights Act, stupid Vietnam War, but, you know, we got rid of that. We started the EPA. You know, there were some, some good things that happened uh, post 1960, but right now, this is, I, there's no other way. I know it, it, we always have a war on this, a war on drugs, a war on it, 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 anything that, that comes up. But, but people have to recognize how insidious and inbred and well-funded this threat is. It's not going to go away on its own. And they keep doubling down they keep attacking right in front of us, and the, the the response has to be total. It has to be massive. It has to be ruthless, and it has to be relentless because this is just where we are. And congratulations for a very perceptive question that, that reminds us of what's ahead of us. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Ken in Boston, Massachusetts Ask why doesn't President Biden invite a few prominent never Trump Republicans into the cabinet or appoint them to other high offices? Secretary Cheney or Senator Romney would be a great way to show that he's trying to unite our fractious country. Well, um, he's not going to uh, appoint him to a cabinet or another high office, uh, but he needs to he needs to uh, align with them, find a way to campaign with some of them. Liz Cheney for sure. Chris Christie probably, probably not Mitt Romney. He'll probably sit it out. <clears throat> Some of the left will object to that, uh, but I think it's a, I, I think if done selectively with people who command respect uh, and a following, uh, I, I think it's something that he clearly ought to do selectively. Yeah, I'm a little more open to maybe appointing somebody to cabinet, but 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 I, I, I don't know. And it, it, it certainly the, the real ideological differences between uh, pre President. Uh, Biden and, and and Congresswoman Cheney or, or, or Chris Christie, but uh, you know, there are other roles that people can take, and that there is some history of, of 
people from the ops party appointing uh, yeah. people to their cabinet. I, I, I think I from Boston. Probably it's a town I was just there. I really like Boston. It's a good place. It's, oh. it's, it's, you can get around it. Oh, it's, it's a it's real the best. city. It's got, you know, and it's not just Harvard and MIT and, you know, it's, it's, it's got a lot of stuff going on. Well, that's Cambridge, it. right. Oh, it's it's a great city. I lived yeah. there for two years, and I still love to go back. It's just yeah. it's an incredible city. Great sports town. Yeah, best. Great uh, culture town. Great political town. Uh, every uh, just full of charm. It's yeah. everything about great Boston. History. Great. Po- everything. I, I love Boston. I really do. Right. No. No. I I I agree. Bill in Joplin, Missouri. James, really good question. Shouldn't the executives of America's biggest corporations? Be wary of the implications of another Trump presidency. It seems all of his foreign policies contribute to insecurity of economic relationships. Am I way off base here? James, what do you think? You know, I, I think at the end of the day, not all. I don't want to lump all corporations, all corporate executives in the same thing. But I just at the end of the day think all they give a shit about is tax cuts. How could all these people show up and support Trump and and see what what Ron DeSantis tried to do to Disney, which is the most offensive thing you can do to a company? But I think until, you know, and and it's always the question of what is the purpose of a corporation. And so many of them grew up with the Milton Freeman, Jack Welch, you know, your your job is to make as much money as you possibly can for yourself and your shareholders and to hell with everything else. And thank you, Boeing. That's exactly where you end up with the stupid jackass profits above patriotism, profits above people. Prof- you, you can be a socially, have some sense of social conscience and still make a bucket load of money. They're not, the two are not incompatible. But I, I got to tell you, I'm... I, my first reaction when I hear one of these people is, you, you do, you'd take the Arizona territorial law if you thought you'd make another another nickel. Yeah. I think that's all too true. Jack Welch made a lot of money short term. Long term, he didn't leave G in a very good position. Sure did. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, um, right. you know, I, I, I think Bill has a very good point, Thank but I'm you afraid you're right. Rob in Hartsdale, New York, says Trump is evil. We agree on that, Rob. How can Democrats best use the fact to get religious people in general and evangelical Christians in particular to vote for Biden or at least not vote for Trump? Rob, I think that's a a, a really a decidedly uphill struggle. Uh, I think uh, the core support, ironically, that this man, Donald Trump, uh, you know, probably one of the you use the right term, evil. I mean, he's someone who's just done terrible things. He's a misogynist. Uh, he pretends he's selling $60 Bibles. Uh, he's never opened it. But he commands a great deal of support in the evangelical community because they think that he's there to protect them. They're wrong, but it's a very real sense. And I don't think Democrats can count much on on really um, carving into that vote. Yeah, that's a broad brush. You, you, on the, that, those kinds of people, Trump is is a theological figure. Right? That they they think he's divinely ordained. That he's sent by God. He's King Cyrus. He's King David. I've been on this for a long time. And and of course, as church attendance deteriorates, and we ought to get that professor from Wake Forest or somebody else that's a, a real student yeah. of American Christianity, because Christianity is. is is, as it is connected to Jesus Christ, is about dead. Okay, it, it, it you look at what's happened in the evangelical and the, 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 the fundamentalist community. You look at the deterioration and the statute of, of which I'm still a member of the Roman Catholic Church. You, you look across it, and it, it's not so much in crisis; it's dying because I think it's all become about something other than Christ's teachings, which I find to be elegant and profound. But it, it the, 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 the crisis in, in American Christianity, it might be over. It might, it might have just lost until they can sort of come back. But the question is spot on. And the last thing that any of these people, there was a thing, in a pastor in Florida 
and they had National Autism Week. And, you know, this is a tragic thing that families go to. And he was attacking that. I, I, the, the cruelty and the, the, the lack of understanding of anything that these people have is a crazy guy in, in Tennessee taking a baseball bat and clubbing the house of Barbie. These people are not Christians in any sense of the word. They, they are lunatics who want to, who just want power over you and want other, they want the government to exercise that power over you. I, I don't give them, I don't think there's anything at all religious about them. I really don't. Yeah, no, I agree. Chris in Poughkeepsie, New York. This is a provocative question, James. Said Hillary told voters uh, who don't want a Trump Biden rematch to quote, get over yourself. Uh, Obama scolded protesters who believe that Biden is complicit in genocide. Why, Chris asked, do we treat the base so contemptuously, often telling them to shut up and fall in line? Is that a winning strategy? Well, let me tell you, I was very skeptical of, of President Biden running for re-election. And, you know, I, so five people followed me, yeah. and Biden is going to be our nominee. And, and, you know, sometimes the threat is so dangerous that you need to shut up and fall in line. Our people don't like to hear that. But, you know, in, in, in 19, early 1942, people shut up and they fell in line. And I, I would say this to my, my, my friends on the left, what are you going to accomplish? I mean, I, 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 frankly, I shut up and fell in line because I thought that was my duty as a citizen of the United States. I'm not, I am a liberal, I am not a leftist, but the, 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 right now, this country is in imminent peril and I, I, it just sounds so terrible, but People that believe in the United States, that believe in the idea of the United States, kind of do need to shut up and fall in line. Because what's the alternative? Yeah, what's the alternative? And, I mean, you know, I, I, again, right, it wasn't, exactly. wasn't a choice that I thought we should have made. It wasn't a choice that I wanted. But it's a choice that we got, and that's just where we're going. And let me tell you, I am totally committed to shutting up and falling in line. Yeah. Kevin in Kansas City, Missouri, asked, how do you see the Trump era finally coming to a close if he is, in fact, defeated once again in November? First, first of all, Kevin, he will not acknowledge he was defeated, no matter what the outcome is. I don't think the Trumpism goes away with Trump. I don't think there's any other magnetic, magnetic demagogue out there as effective uh, as he is. But he's spawned a whole bunch of mini Trumps, like J.D. Vance. Uh, and I think they have taken over a lot of the party. Uh, I mean, look at the people they've condemned. Jim Lankford was condemned by the Oklahoma Republican Party for trying to come up with a border control bill that basically was what Republicans had been asking for. But he was savage. So I, I, I hope Trump will get the drubbing he deserves in November. Uh, the sooner he disappears from the American political scene, even if it's in a prison somewhere, the better. But I don't think Trumpism is going to go away for a while. So, so this goes to the essence. So which do you agree with more? Donald Trump is a, a demagogue of the first order and hit upon this message that stimulated people and convinced them that their lives were, were lesser lives. And he took something latent that was out there and it, it started to manifest itself in a political movement. Or do you believe... Trumpism was always out there, and its people had this prejudice, they had this resentment, and it all existed, and Trump came along, nurtured it, and when Trump goes, it will still exist, and we will still have shitty, unpatriotic people in this country that have no idea of what the American idea is and American ideals are, and I am a firm believer in option number two. I think that there are a lot of bigoted people in this country that are looking 
to hurt other people, and Trump came along. They were sitting there before he came, and they will be there after he leaves. But other people think differently. Take your pick. It's a good conversation to have at your neighborhood. It is a good conversation. I I fear. I hope you're wrong. I fear you're right. Right. Jeff in St. Pete Beach, Florida. This is to you specifically. He said, if Trump wins, which he thinks seems more likely, what does it say about the Democratic Party that they lost to this sick clown? Well, it, it, the Democratic Party is perpetually, I use the word I use, is constipated because the Democratic Party is a coalition. And it won't say anything good about the Democratic Party, but reference the last question we had it will say a lot bad about the American people. And we'll just become so accustomed to you know, talking about the American people are good, and we need something to reflect the goodness and deep, innate, charitable nature that the people of this country has had. I don't say I, I, I don't know that I buy that. If, let's see. I don't want to say I'm proven right or wrong. But if, if we re-elect this guy in any kind of way, shape, form. After everything that people know, we're just going to have to conclude that the people that vote in presidential election are just rotten-ass people. Oh, that makes me sick. It makes it me does. sad. It does. But I don't, it does. It's, I wish I could I wish I could refute. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I hate refute to do it. I'm that. sure somebody's going to pick this up and uh, James Carville calls I know. Americans well, it's it's just, might be. But, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it's it's reality. Anyway, listen, your questions are great, even when they're painful, uh, like the one from Jeff. But please keep them coming. If we didn't get to yours this week, we'll get to it next week, we hope. Thank you very much. We love our listeners. Thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Now, following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, Total Gym, Beam, and Miracle Made in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. Now, to keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You can also find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. And remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning. 